Hello and welcome to Tangled Up in Poetry. Today we're going to be studying Night Sweat by Robert Lowell. So here he is, looking a bit fresher than the first picture. Um, so he wrote innovative and experimental poetry. Uh, he wrote about many different topics. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about his life um, that he writes about in this poem, it's relevant to this poem, is that he suffered from uh, extreme bipolar disorder. I'm going to share a video with you in a moment if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that because I won't be going into it in a lot of detail uh, in this video. So who was Robert Lowell's wife? Her name was Elizabeth Hardwick and she was a formidably intelligent woman and she was actually the co-founder of the New York Review of Books in uh, 1964. So she was very well read, very um, intellectual woman. She stood by Lowell through some very hard times Okay, so what is the poem about? Well, the writer, Lowell, has writer's block. That's when um, you're trying to write something, you've probably experienced it yourselves, but you just can't put words on the page. You're sitting there, you know you need to write, you know you've got your assignment due in, or you're trying to be creative, and you just can't think of anything to write. And that's pretty much what the poem is about. Uh, Lowell, in his room, um, kind of stressed about not being able to find inspiration. Uh, the poem has a sort of confused and scared tone. Um, Lowell is scared and worried about his own state of mind. Uh, in the poem, he is very tired and very nervous, and that's to do with the title Night Sweat. He's kind of having a panic attack or a moment of anxiety uh, in the night. And he, he describes his illness as his life's fever. So he kind of personifies his bipolar disorder. Okay, so this is the poem, Night Sweat by Robert Lowell. Work table, litter, books, and standing lamp. Plain things, my stalled equipment, the old broom. But I'm living in a tidied room. For ten nights now, I felt the creeping damp float over my pyjamas wilted white. Sweet salt embalms me, and my head is wet. Everything streams and tells me this is right, my life's fever is soaking in night sweat. One life, one writing. But the downward glide and bias of existing rings us dry. Always inside me is the child who died. Always inside me is his will to die. One universe, one body. In this urn, the animal night sweats of the spirit burn. Behind me, you. Again, I feel the light, light in my leaded eyelids, while the grey skulled horses whinny for the soot of night. I dabble in the dapple of the day, a heap of wet clothes, see me shivering, I see my flesh and bedding washed with light, my child exploding into dynamite, my wife. Your lightness alters everything and tears the black web from the spider's sack, as your heart hops and flutters like a hare. Poor turtle, tortoise. If I cannot clear the surface of these troubled waters here, absolve me, help me, dear heart, as you bear this world's dead weight and cycle on your back. Okay, so it is quite a complex poem. It's quite difficult to understand at first reading. So I'll talk you through some of the basic ideas that I found in it. And of course, you need to bring your own interpretation to uh, what I'm giving you here is just a mere introduction and my own personal interpretation. OK, so it begins with Robert Lowell sitting at his work table and there is litter everywhere. Uh, his books are sort of scattered around. There's a lamp and um, you get the impression he's kind of alone in this room with his, his writing tools. Um, he talks about his writing tools being litter. It's all but a bit of a mess. Uh, there could be a double meaning to litter. Um, it could suggest that his he's viewing his work as trash. Um, because later, in the next couple of lines, we actually see that the room is tidy. And so we can probably interpret the litter as being a metaphor for his work. He's not having much faith in his own work, and he's not happy with what he's producing. We see um, he describes his equipment as stalled. Now, this again could mean um, the fact that he's not lifting his pen to the paper, 
And so his tools are stalled because he's not using his tools. But it could also be referring to his mind. And that's what I was saying earlier about him having writer's block. Perhaps um, at this moment, he feels mentally stalled and he can't think of any ideas because of his anxiety and his depression. Um, it's a kind of stream of consciousness, this poem. His thoughts kind of interrupt one another and one thought interrupts his own doubts about his messy room and his stalled equipment is that the room is tidy. Now, this is where Elizabeth Hardwick, his wife, first comes into the poem because we can predict that perhaps she is the one that has tidied the room because he says, I'm living in a tidied room. It gives the impression that it was tidied by somebody else. Um, then he talks about being in this situation of anxiety and writer's block for 10 nights and it's really getting him down. And he says, he uses personification here to describe the sweating feeling of nervousness of not being able to write. He describes it with this verb, creeping damp. Now, the word creeping for me has connotations of a sort of sinister um, atmosphere. And it makes me feel as though this illness that he's suffering from is something that slowly creeps on him and he can feel it coming and he knows it's going to happen. And it can really stall him and make him unable to work and make progress and think. Um, OK, so again, another verb is really interesting, is wilted. He says the creeping damp floats over his pyjamas, wilted white. Now, the word wilt is what happens to a flower when it has died. So when you see a flower in autumn or in the summer when it's got too hot and it hasn't had enough water, it will kind of like fall over and shrivel up and die. It's a very kind of sad um, word to describe nature. And so perhaps he's now comparing himself to nature. And perhaps he is feeling as though his mind and his energy is wilting. There's another verb, a third verb in the following line, which says, sweet salt embalms me. Now, embalming as a process is what people used to do to dead bodies. It's what people did in ancient Egypt to the mummies before they wrapped them in materials. They would embalm them to preserve them. So he is saying that the sweat and the salt in his sweat is actually embalming his body. So not only does he compare himself to a wilting flower, he's now actually saying that he feels like he's a sort of dead man in this world. So again, he's expressing his suffering and his bipolar disorder through this poem and through these really powerful verbs. Uh, moving on a few lines down, um, he actually personifies his bipolar disorder by again referring to it as we discussed earlier as his life's fever and he uses sibilance in this line to say soaking in night sweat now remember sibilance is the repetition of fricatives and a fricative can take any form such as s f th or sh those kind of sounds that have that kind of S sound, we call them sibilance. And they often provide some kind of atmosphere to the line. For example, my life's fever is soaking in night sweat. I, I sort of get this sort of visceral imagery of the sweat kind of creeping up on him through those S sounds. Now, this is a really interesting line where he says the bias of existing rings us dry. So he's saying that just to exist is biased. Um, so he's kind of saying, in my opinion, that just by being born, you are kind of forced into a category which is biased, possibly against you. So you might have an identity that you think you are, but society encourages you to be something different. And so just by existing, we're kind of pressured in a biased way to be a certain way or to, you know, conform to certain rules. And so he's actually really despairing in this line. And then he says that inside him, 
always there is a child who died. And I guess you could say that about any adult, really. Every adult who's walking the earth right now was a child at some point. And he is saying that the child inside him died, which perhaps means that when he was a child, he was youthful and happy and energetic and viewed the world positively and optimistically. And perhaps in his old age, this has reduced and he has sort of become a different person as an adult that he doesn't like, he's not happy with. Perhaps he connects his creativity and ability to write with his child youthful energy. And then he talks about the animal night sweat as being animal night sweat. He uses this word animal, this adjective to describe it. So it's almost like he's being hunted by himself from within. All of a sudden, the tone kind of changes. You get these two exclamation marks at the start of this line where he says, behind me, you. And it feels as though his wife has entered the room at this stage and he feels her supportive presence. He then says, I feel the light lighten my leaded eyelids. We're not sure if she walked into the room or if he's just thinking about her. So before she walked into the room or into his mind, he was feeling very heavy and he was feeling very dull, very tired, uh, not happy, didn't want to open his eyes and see the world around him. But then when she enters his life, all of a sudden his eyelids are light and he is willing to open his eyes to see the light and let the light in. So you've got kind of connotations here of, again, hope versus despair and what gives you motivation, what keeps you going. And of course, here, his wife, Elizabeth Hardwick, is the motivation to keep him going. The imagery of weight so remember, imagery deals with things like visual representation, smell, sounds, um, touch, texture. But you can also think of it as, as weight. Uh, and in this sense, we, we get this sort of lightness that comes to the poem. It's not so dense and depressed anymore. It's sort of light and a bit freer. Um, then we've got this really striking metaphor of horses pulling his attention back to despair. Um, you've got the scold horses whinny for the soot of night. Scold horses whinny for the soot of night. So the fact that they're sculled gives me the impression that they're kind of um, horses that are going straight to hell. Um, and the whinnying is just the noise that a horse makes. And they are whinnying, they are hoping, they are pushing, they're pulling him to the soot of night. Soot is the stuff at the bottom of a chimney when you had a fire that sort of falls down from the chimney. Um, and so he's got these sculled horses trying to pull him back to the darkness and he's got his wife pulling him towards the light. So this is a really important moment in the poem where he is being torn in two directions. And then again, we see the light come through. I dabble in the dapple of the day. And then suddenly it seems his bipolar disorder reasserts itself. Um, but this time he finds inspiration from it. Um, so he says, a child exploding into dynamite. A child exploding into dynamite. Perhaps this represents his manic moments that we described at the start, where he kind of has outbursts of anger or frustration. And perhaps he's thinking about that as his inner child trying to break out of his adult restrictive socialization. And then we see his love for his wife, which is finally revealed in the last sort of six lines. She is presented as a kind of holy or godlike character. He says, my wife, and then we have this ellipsis, the three dots. Now remember, we don't do three dots in our writing normally. You often write them in text messages, but the ellipsis actually means something in poetry. It's really important. It's a very subtle, gentle pause and often a kind of change happens. So you've got the ellipsis, the three dots after my wife, where I guess he's just kind of allowing a moment of silence. My wife, your lightness alters everything. It's almost like the thought of her brings life to his mind and brings light and happiness and joy and hope and all of the great things um, that he, he gets from his marriage. He says, your lightness alters everything. He says, your light tears the black web from the spider's sack. Now, let's just repeat that line. Your light tears the black web from the spider's sack. 
So it's almost like she is removing the spider's web that is dominating his thoughts, the depression, the bipolar, the, the, the restriction of being an adult, the restriction of being a writer, the difficulty he has dealing with his own mental health. And she removes that kind of web of negativity that he is sort of caught in all the time. Winston Churchill used to call depression the black dog that would creep up on him. And here we're seeing it in a kind of similar sense, like a black spider web. And I guess depression is quite hard to describe, isn't it? So you often end up in metaphors. And then towards the end of the poem, um, he describes her as a poor turtle carrying him on her back. So he feels like he's a burden to her. He feels like she is carrying the marriage and carrying him and keeping him going. He then begs her for help and comfort at one point where we see this uh, phrase, absolve me, help me, dear heart, help me. We see a real cry there of desperation. Okay, so that's kind of the end of my brief analysis. And just on the screen now, you've got a few essay questions. If you'd like to have a go at writing one, I would encourage you to do that. Um, remember, when you do write an essay, you should always try and introduce it with a roadmap and explain what you're going to talk about in the essay. Now, I normally tell students to write three key points in the introduction, and those three key points are what are going to feature in the three main analytical paragraphs after the introduction. And then at the end, you can just do a short conclusion of no more than 100 words explaining what we learn from this poem, what your personal take is from this poem. Uh, you don't want any quotes in the introduction or the conclusion, um, but in the introduction, you do want to sort of reveal the three topic sentences or the point sentences that are going to be at the start of the three main analytical paragraphs. And you always want to have around 200 words in each analysis paragraph, and you want about between three and eight quotes in each paragraph. No quotes in the introduction, no quotes in the conclusion, but definitely lots of quotes in the main analysis paragraphs. And you must not repeat yourself throughout the essay and do answer the essay question. OK, so if you want the full PowerPoint with other activities and ideas, uh, you can follow the link at the bottom. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope it was useful. Uh, please let me know your thoughts on this poem because I'd like to hear other interpretations and other perspectives. It's a really, really interesting poem and one that we can probably all learn a lot from.